uh, we're going to talk about uncertainty in the world, use of real options to navigate that uncertainty, and then we're going to apply that to portfolio, look at a quantified example, and then we're going to address that with, uh, and you know, kind of pull all the pieces together. Times there are changing. Uh, uh, Bob Dylan in 1964, that was the case, and I think the point we want to draw here is that that change has increased in an in ever uh, increasingly rapid rate. To look at technological adoption, uh, two slides. The first one here is, talks about adoption over a 25% uh, of U.S. households. And we can see how over time the adoption rate for technological items really starts to decrease and decrease, decrease quite dramatically. Uh, shifting to the next slide. To we're talking about decades in terms of the adoption rate. Now, a lot of this is due to Moore's Law. And if we look at the overall computing capacity and the number of transistors that are being sold and uh, consumed in computer processing, in, in recent years, we've gone from good growth to exponential growth. The impact that that has, as we uh, Facebook and we look at Twitter is the adoption now is actually becoming phenomenal in terms of companies being able to move very, very quickly into very, very large markets. So what I've done is kind of taken a hypothetical graph here that shows the slope of definite increasing technology through the 1950s and as this computing capacity has risen exponentially, has, so has that rate of technological change. So what we have is there are fewer constants and there are more variables, so we have more choices. Um, that's good from a consumer perspective. The difficulty we have is that our ability to predict and that horizon for being able to see where we can get a return is starting to shrink. And we're getting to the point where the market change is really outpacing our ability to adequately estimate likely outcomes. So when we now apply that hypothetical technological slope, it has the opposite impact to product life cycle. So where in the past we might have had the comfort of, of getting returns for, you know, in, in good old days, decades, and then more recently, maybe if we had a project that was going to give us five to seven years, that's great. We now have to look at a shorter and shorter horizon in terms of where we can get a return. An example of this in my, my space, uh, if you take a look at the adoption rate from 2004 through 2008, if you're an investor in that company, you're feeling reasonably good as you start the 2008 year because even though your growth is slow, you're at north of 100 million uh, active users and you're still have no, you, you still have a positive uh, trajectory. However, we can see, and as we all are probably well aware, that trajectory did not continue. It dropped down fairly dramatically after 2008. So what happened? Well, there was a company by the name of Facebook that was potentially underneath the radar. So when you were getting into a, when, when MySpace was getting into their planning cycle in 2008, it may or may not have anticipated the adoption of Facebook. So as that is creeping forward, we see that Facebook took off and that had a negative impact to MySpace. Point being here, as even though there was a quick adoption for MySpace, the tail off of, as uh, Facebook came in was, was very, very rapid. So we're getting into a scenario where we have uh, historically looked at an investment and had an expected return. Now, with the same investment, if that return horizon shrinks, we've got a problem. As a financial for investment, remedy that so that we maintain our return. But we're getting to the point where the ability to shrink the investment to a point that's small enough to address the fact that we've got a very shrunken return or expected return is being limited. And as our confidence decreases as expected return decreases. So we're converging on this point where we're unable to reduce the investment to a size that would, you know, would give us an adequate return. So if we take a look from kind of the good old days and traditional uh, uh, project business case, 
things were a little bit easier back then, right? We had a quantified marketable market opportunity where we could be several years in, in advance and have an expectation that we we're going to get that return. Have an estimated cost of the investment because we might have history to go forward. And then all had like, you know, good program governance and control and make sure that we executed well on project. If we did that, we could have the confidence of getting return for many, many years. I'm going to go to uh, 19, excuse me. I'm going to go to uh, 1971, and during that period of time, if you have an expected return uh, that might be several years out, even though you've got technology that's increasing, somebody that is looking forward would have reasonable confidence that they could make an investment decision at that point in time and be fairly comfortable. One of the examples that I want to use here is a company that I uh, became CEO of on a temporary basis uh, in around 2005. Uh, this company had had a mini empire in the 1960s. It was an asphalt producer, asphalt distributor, and uh, what it did is it, it had operated in the low-tech industry and it had multiple distributions throughout the Midwest, largely rural. This was kind of a time cap, so what had happened is the person that had built up the empire in the 1960s died in the early 70s and he left the business to his wife. And his wife had a lot of confidence in her business capability, but what she did do is she had a lot of confidence in the business that her husband had built. So from 1971 until she passed away in, in 2005, she literally had no changes made to the business. There was not a computer on site. Um, they still had the same processing of invoices and payroll and everything else. In fact, most of the staff were in their 70s and 80s. So when I walked in, what was even more amazing than the fact that we have this time capsule where nothing had changed is these assets were still providing a return. There was still positive cash flow, not to the extent that it had been in the 1970s, and not all the assets were operating, but this was a business that for decades was able, because of the low technology and the low rate of change, to get a return for many, many years. Now, when we move up the timetable to uh, you know, 1998, I'm going to use another example. And this is a company uh, that I worked with that was a manufacturer. And when we take a look at the horizon they were looking at, they were looking at things were changing a little bit quicker. So the confidence in which they could make a decision became quite a bit uh, reduced. So <clears throat> their situation was that they were a domestic manufacturer and they had, fra they had fragmented uh, manufacturing. They had looked at the prospect of what they were going to do and this was a good and sharp management group. So what the good and sharp management group did is they said, let's get smart about this. And instead of building in the U.S. here in the 1990s, let's look and see if there isn't a, a more effective, cost-effective way to build. So what they did is they took the logical step in their mind, and they, they decided to go to Mexico and build a plant in Mexico. Uh, what they did is they were able to consolidate all their manufacturing, they were able to, in, from their perspective, they doubled capacity because they knew they were going to be producing uh, products that were cheaper than all the other domestic suppliers. And uh, life was good. The only problem is when they moved to Mexico and in the three years that it took them to build this state-of-the-art plant, they actually, the rest of the industry went to China. So by the time they opened up the plant, the products that they were producing were already obsolete and, and not economically viable. So this is a situation where the company is making what it believes to be a good business decision, but it fails. And it fails because the horizon in which they were looking was not accurate. With it. The guess they made wasn't there. So what we're doing is we're moving from what used to be knowable to the what I'm calling unknowable. And when we think about what a project is, by definition, a project is looking for an anticipated future need. And as part of that, we need to be able to prove a business case. We have assumptions that we need to prove. But we're moving into a scenario now where we no longer have the ability to make rational decisions 
So how do we move forward? How can we actually be, be effective in doing that? So you as corporations today, how are they investing? What are they doing? Uh, something came out, I think this was in March, <clears throat> and they talked about that there's more cash on the sidelines in U.S. corporations than there's been since the 1950s. So if we think about the whys of that, of course, we're coming out of an economic recession. You say, well, people are, you know, they're waiting until times get better. Historically, a recession was a time to buy. If you had cash and you had certainty in what you wanted to do, assets were depressed and you had the ability to make more investments. So we see a situation where, with the uncertainty, people aren't sure of the bets that they want to make. I'm going to use a um, hypothetical example here by the name of uh, the Acme Phone Component Company. This is a situation where they've got a $10 million capital budget. The industry experience is experiencing good growth. Uh, the, <clears throat> the projected unit growth is excellent from their perspective. This is the late, late 80s, early 1990s, and they're making components that go into pay phones. Uh, where's the market going? There may be limited local calls, but there's heavy reliance on this newer thing that's come out, phone cards, where people use their phone card. And they're looking for a competitive advantage. So as they look at their options, it's, they come up with this great concept of a credit card. The credit card interface is going to allow them uh, to replace the need for change from the consumer's perspective. It's going to replace the phone card. And the only problem is it's going to take them three years to get this done based on how they put their business plan together and what they do. But from their perspective, they feel that the likelihood of success is really kind of a can't-miss scenario. So they move forward. Well, no real surprise here. When we take a look at what actually happened in their industry, instead of that trajectory of growth that they were anticipating in the surefire winter, payphone numbers actually dropped during that period of time. So their reliance and uh, dependency on the traditional methods failed them. So let's take a look at what I did and um, what the problems were. First of all, was the scope accurate? Sure, it was accurate. It was, it was what they wanted to do. Was the budget, budget accurate? We're going to go ahead and give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they were able to put, put the pieces together uh, effectively. Um, did the market demand meet expectations at the time of the delivery? And the answer here is no. So why did they fail? Why didn't things work out? And what failed Acme in this case is the system. They did what they thought. They did, they, they did what they were taught to do. They what all of their business experience told them to do. But the system that they had, relying on assumptions that couldn't be known at the time they put it together, led them to failure. So that leads us to what do we do in this situation? Before we're going to talk a little about, about something called real options. Now, options overall, I'm, I'm sure we've all heard of financial options, puts and calls, and those kinds of things. And I'm fortunately for everybody, I'm going to spare you with, uh, with going into any detail on that. Real options are a little bit different. Uh, definition, it's an option that a business gains by taking, a, taking on a certain investment. And in other words, it's an exploratory or limited investment a company may make to confirm the upside of a further investment. So what we're talking about, it's really an investment in knowledge, where a company invests just enough to consumption, and when a variable becomes a constant, the overall project certainly reduced. What this does is it minimizes the sunk cost and it can maximize uh, these successful outcomes. I'm going to go on to another hypo uh, hypothetical example here. Oh, excuse me. Actually, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the decision tree. So when we walk through the assumption number one, and if the assumption number one, there's an investment made to confirm that that assumption is, is either accurate or not accurate. If it's not accurate, you have the ability to stop the project. If it is accurate, then you can go on to assumption number two and confirm that, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that you're gaining knowledge through this whole process, and as you gain knowledge, you gain confidence in your business case, and that you have the ability or you have the appropriate information to go forward. So I'm going to use a hypothetical example of regressive uh, life insurance. Uh, this is a situation where 
uh, this is a company that has been selling life insurance for a number of years and working exclusively through a broker network. Their target customers are 50 to 70 years old and historically had not been big users of the internet, but recently this company is losing market share and losing it rapidly and they believe because maybe now these buyers are, are getting more comfortable in purchasing over the internet. And they're kicking around the concept of an, a project that's going to take them 12 months to produce and it would be a, a, a web-based service, soup to nuts, that's going to provide them with the ability to not only have people uh, sign up online, but process them automated, uh, from the automated way all the way through. Now, they're very knowledgeable and they actually acknowledge that they've got some risks here. One of the risks is that they have no te technological expertise internally. They also have no internet expertise. Um, one of the concerns they have is if they open up this separate channel, do they lose their brokers that have been providing them good business for, through these years? Is there channel confusion from the customer's perspective? And then ultimately, if they make this bet and the marketplace simply doesn't accept it, what do they do? When they review this, they're looking at the potential of a big bang release, and what we're talking about is proving a business case up front taking all of these assumptions, all of these unknowns, you know, working really hard on putting all the pieces together, and at the end, we're going to say go or no go. And if it's a go, we're going to allocate the budget, we're going to specify the requirements, and we're going to implement the solution. What the real options approach might look like here is an incremental investment in this, an investment in knowledge bites so that they can find their way through the process. And then based on these findings, they can validate a further investment. And then they would continue this process as long as there was sufficient uh, business value. We'll go back to the decision tree, and what it might look like for a regressive is because they're not technologists, and the ability to build their own platform they recognize would, would uh, cause probably more problems than anything else, they they do investigation to find out, is there a third-party platform that's available to them? If that can be confirmed, the next step may, well, let's pull some of our key brokers together and let's do a focus group and let's find out what those brokers think about the process. In fact, let's invite them to figure out how they can maybe benefit from the, the, the path we're going down. And then when they've got that confidence, maybe the first step in the process is let's just do online application. Let's not complete the whole thing, but let's see if the market actually accepts this concept because we can still process these people through our existing backroom operation. And as they go further and further through, they can put more and more automation, but before they do that, they've confirmed all the previous steps to make sure that it makes sense. So you might think, okay, well, doesn't the Big Bang case kind of confirm all this anyway? Don't we do that on the front end? And the problem that we have is that the assumptions that are made when we do the Big Bang, we need to put assumptions into all these variables. We can't know this beforehand. We don't have the ability to do the investigation. We can do some investigation, but not enough investigation to get that feedback. So what we've done with the Big Bang is we're allocating all of the capital up front and, based on, and basing it on limited information. And once that capital is allocated, the business case becomes incontestable, meaning that the, the company will go forward, and that's irrespective of any information that might come from the marketplace or might come from the development or other team that's working on this. The other opportunity that uh, Real uh, Options brings to the table is when we've got senior management you know, often, in, in fact, uh, you've got charismatic senior management, it's a good and a bad thing. The good element is that means that you've got leadership and you've got people, you've got people in front that others are willing to follow. The bad thing about that is a lot of times senior executives don't realize the power of their words. So when somebody comes and gives an, gives an impassioned speech about, we are going to go down this road, this is our new road, we are absolutely going to the internet, uh, this we are, we are remaking this company, people listen and they understand that is the direction we're going. So when information comes in at all levels, if that information is in, can, would contrast the facts that would lead you to believe that that made sense, there's really no mechanism to communicate that up. 
And in fact, it can be just the opposite, where people feel frightened about doing that and feel that there might be job security associated with it. In a number of the restructurings that I've worked on, one of the biggest things that is, is it used, to, uh, used to kind of amaze me, and now I come to expect it, and that is oftentimes when you go and you do the analysis for a company that is not performing the way that it should, the individuals at the uh, line level and in middle management often are very aware of what's going on. Senior management often does not have that information and it's not been communicated to them. So in summary, when you look at real options, what we're talking about is take steps to increase knowledge and stop early if the assumptions are proven false, invest incrementally as assumptions are confirmed, and then reallocate the capital based on the new knowledge that comes out. So next step is I want to take a look at how would you add this to the overall portfolio. When we look at our standard portfolio, you use a uh, <clears throat> hypothetical situation here, we have a budget budget period, 12-month budget cycle. Let's call it January 1st in this example. And if I'm the portfolio manager and I get my job on January 1st, I take a look at what my options are here. And I have two projects that are in process. I've got one project that's being launched, probably already approved by the time I showed up, so I've got to get that thing rolling. And then I've heard that maybe second half we may do a second uh, project. So from an active portfolio management, there's really not a lot for me to do. I guess I can confirm that the money's being spent as expected, but I'm not really driving to the point of active management under this scenario. So when I take a look at <clears throat> what that brings me to, I've got larger projects, which means that I have fewer projects, which by definition means that I have less diversification. And in a day where things are changing so much, you want to maintain your options, you want to increase that diversification. I've got longer projects, so I'm spanning annual budget cycles. So the ability to uh, move my portfolio around, and in fact, when we've got a lot of uh, people that are changing jobs on a pretty frequent basis, oftentimes people won't even accept responsibility for the projects that are in play. And then finally, this concept of delivering all the value at the end from a serial uh, perspective again, limits my options and limits my ability to change. So if we were to look at how this might look from a real options perspective, is we take this portfolio and we're going to break it down into various value bites. And we're going to confirm value at each step of the way and make sure that it makes sense. So. I'm also going to take a hard look and say, okay, now where can I bring this, you know, in, in the example of um, Regressive, we didn't do a soup to nuts launch. What we did is we brought an early release to get an online, um, online application. So what might I do under this is I'm going to push everything to market with the minimum amount I can because one is I can get a return from that. Number two is I don't necessarily need to make the investment in the overall project. And Number three is I get that market feedback, which is extremely valuable. The other thing that I can do is I can now actively manage the portfolio. I can stop a project. I can reallocate funds to other projects. If something comes up midstream that makes a lot of sense, I can go ahead and go forward on that, and I can shuffle. I don't have to wait till the next budget cycle. So I take this concept of understanding the market, and I play it into my portfolio decisions. I break, break the projects into a series of options, I reallocate the investment, and then I can increase an investment, I can delay it, or I can stop it. So historically, we've seen these big bang releases that have dominated the airways, and it made sense because we had rational business cases that we could put forward. As we get to the point where we no longer have rational business cases that can look far enough out, we've got to look at further allocation and more and more allocation from a real options perspective. So <clears throat> what we're talking about is giving our, ourselves the ability to increase diversification, ability to monitor and manage and perform within the budget cycle, ability to redirect funds from losers to winners, and then optimize the portfolio within the budget cycle. So the analogy here is if you are at the track and you're making a bet, 
you may, you know, in the, under the old scenario, maybe you bet on one or two horses, and then you sit down and you wait for the race to be over to see if you've won or not. Under a real options portfolio approach, you could make multiple bets, smaller bets, across a number of horses, and as that race develops, you can start removing a portion of the bets on those in the back of the pack and put them on those in the front of the pack. So what you're doing is you're increasing your chance for success through the process and not waiting until the end of the race to figure that out. Now I'm going to move to an example of being able to uh, quantify how this might work or what it might look like. I'm going to go back to regressive and regressive uh, you know, had put a fine pencil on this and they came up with a project of $4.8 million to do their Big Bang release. They anticipate it's going to be $400,000 over a 12-month period of time. And they're going to get all the value uh, at the end of the end. They're going to have a big bang release at the end of 12 months. Expected monthly income, $200,000. Ongoing operating support, $50,000. So in summary, what they have is $4.8 million and then $150,000 per month thereafter. Now, when they put their business plan together, they try to figure out what's their expected return going to be. And they, they're looking at a five-year horizon. They feel that that's, that's uh, reasonably adequate, that they should have, that they should be able to. And when you, when you do the math, you come up with 18.5% intraday return. Now, in Regressive's case, they have an IRR threshold of 15%. So this is a thumbs up. It makes them to go forward, and they pull the trigger, and they move forward. And then if we look at that on a monthly basis, that means for the first 12 months, they're spending 400000 and then until the end of the five-year horizon in which they're doing their analysis, they're expecting $150,000 per month. Further look at this is we have um, an investment that peaks after 12 months, and then over time there's a payback that continues until they hit a break-even. But look at this. The break-even doesn't happen until month number 43. Okay, let's think about that for a second. In this world, in a project that actually at 18.5% is not a bad return, we're looking at not even getting to the point where we get our first dollar of value in above our investment until, you know, in the, in the near four-year time frame. And then as a result of that, the return that we need to get is at the tail end of that process. So how this looks kind of on the books <coughs> from uh, Regressive's perspective, it's a capital project. It's $4.8 million. They've got cash allocation of 4.8, meaning they have to make that full investment. And they've got a write-off risk of $4.8 million as well. And what I mean by a write-off risk is when you've got the decision on the business case, you pull the trigger, and you move forward on the investment, it's very difficult to stop that. And unless there's an early trip and somebody who is senior enough in the organization can recognize it, what everybody's been instructed to do is spend that money. So not until you get toward the tail end of the project where potentially things have gone sideways do you recognize that, wow, we might have a problem here. And one could argue that that $4.8 million is, is actually higher because when the executives are now looking at a project in trouble where you've got nearly uh, your full, full 4.8 spent, what are their decisions? Do they write off at that point or do they put another million into it? And we've all seen before where projects continue to get funded and continue to fail going forward. So <clears throat> if we look at this now from a real options perspective, how it might look, we would take the same project, we're going to break it into a series of smaller go-no-go -no -go decisions, kind of mini business cases here. And as we go forward, we're going to use the team's input and the market input for, to uh, help us determine what we want to do. We're going to determine the quickest path to market and continue with the go-no-go -no -go process as we get information from the market. So after, setting, <clears throat> after getting to market with the initial minimum feature set, we're now going to prioritize the remaining features for the highest business value. So if you look at means, it means our release number one, because we want to get value and we want to actually start this, we anticipate that we're going to get a big chunk of the value. Because we've now prioritized, by definition, 
each subsequent release is going to have less and less value as we go forward with uh, release number two, release number three, and then in the tail end we've got releases that don't necessarily measure up to what we've had before. But again, that makes sense because we prioritize that what, what makes the most sense. So we're going to take the same arrangement as we did before under Waterfall, but it looks a little bit different with, with real options. Under this scenario, it took us three months to get to a something deliverable to the market, so those first three months look exactly the same as, as under Waterfall. But in the subsequent releases, we now see that the amount of cash the organization needs to apply to this investment is reduced. And it's reduced from the income that we're getting from the initial releases. Now, it's not reduced after the first one by $150,000, but it's reduced by a portion of that because we're getting a portion of the value. And each subsequent release, as we get more value, we have less and less cash that we need to invest. So when we take a look at what this means from our overall investment, we no longer need to make the full, full $4.8 million. Our peak investment has reduced. Our break-even break has moved from 43 to 37 months. And our return is, is we're actually able to look at a higher return horizon than we have from the past. Going back to the waterfall, that was a $4.8 million capital project. Under the real options approach, the first release is viewed as a project. That's a $1.2 million project. As we've confirmed that we didn't want to go to release number two, release number three, we continue to make investments. So at the end of the day, we're going to have a $4.8 million overall capital spend. The difference is the amount of cash that we need to put in is reduced because we're able to start to underwrite the project with proceeds from the project. Very compelling element here is remember we talked about that write-off risk of $4.8 million? Well, under a real options approach, I'm going to argue that that write-off risk is after your first release, after three months. Because after three months, if the project has gone so far sideways that it doesn't make sense, you've got the ability to pull the plug. And I'd make a further argument when you take the real options approach, what you're going to do is you're confirming all your assumptions up front. So you may pull the plug after a couple of initial investments when you find out that it doesn't make sense. And if it goes the other way, if the information you're, you're gaining actually helps you, you can now hone the project so that it can maximize return in the marketplace. And it certainly can give you the confidence in making those further incremental investments. So when you look at it overall, Waterfall, remember we were 4.8 million cash, 4.8 million capital, and 4.8 million write-off risk. Under the real options, we've got only a $4.8 million capital, less cash that we put into it, and our risk, overall risk of project failure has reduced quite a bit. This does, by being able to get that cash in early and help underwrite the project, we're able to increase our overall return. So where we were looking at an IRR of 18.5% under waterfall, that's now increased to 30%. No funny math here. This is simply the value of early release. And when we look at a company that is looking at a threshold of 15% IRR, we're now talking about potentially doubling it simply by, by applying these, this methodology. Now, when we go back, remember we talked about that um, prioritization and being able to capture the value on, on the front end. So when we look at what this means, from an overall basis, the waterfall product was 18.5%. My first release, it's higher than 18.5%, but it's, it's lower than subsequent releases. And the reason being here is it took me three months to get to my first release. But what really is pretty amazing is when you look at that release two and release three and release four, you have phenomenal returns. You're talking north of 200% for release number two. How does this happen? You've got one increment, one month of expense, you're capturing your highest value items, and you get your return fairly immediately because you're releasing immediately. Now the counter of that is as time goes by, when you start to get to the releases that have less and less value, we get into a situation where we actually no longer are even above our hurdle rate of 15%. So 
if we're good managers and we're going to adhere to our corporate policy, we're going to remove those last four releases from the overall program. Why are we doing this? Because it doesn't make sense anymore. We no longer have a valid business case for release number seven. And in fact, when we get to the later releases, we actually have a negative return on those. So our project starts to look a little bit different now in that our CapEx investment has reduced. Overall cash investment has reduced further. Right off risk, we're going to keep at that $1.2 million because we had to get through the first release and first iteration. So when we apply this to the overall graph, what we're showing is that that investment has reduced quite a bit. Our break even is now around month 30, 31, and our return horizon has really expanded. So where before we were looking at a small return over a much larger investment, we're now looking at a much smaller investment and a much larger return, which from a financial guy's perspective can give you some very impressive things. And let's go to the next slide here. Waterfall, 18%. When we did Agile and kept everything in place, we're at, at north of 30%. But we're talking about by being able to reduce those low value items that we get a return up to a 50% level. So look at this in summary, we've got CapEx that was reduced by 33%, meaning that we were able to reduce the capital. Our cash budget was reduced by 40%, and the dollar risk was reduced by 75%. Remember what that is, is that we didn't have to find out at the end of 12 months whether this worked or not. And the overall return was able to increase by almost, three, by almost 300%. So it, extremely impressive in terms of what we can get with this. So, on, from a portfolio perspective, when you try to apply this, what we're looking at is we have less capital tied up, right? We don't have the same cash, which means it allows us more investments and the ability to have more diversification. We've got early release, improves corporate profits, and allows for increased capital expenditure. And by committing the capital incrementally, multiple projects can be taken on simultaneously. What I mean here is you don't have to give a $4.8 million allocation to this budget. You can have a much lower allocation and you can take on other projects that may be compete, may be complement, but are going to at least give you the ability to run down parallel paths. And when you get to the point that you have more confidence and more uh, certainty of return, you can, re you can shuffle uh, resources accordingly and apply the, apply the proceeds that you need to. And now the go, no-go decision, decision includes, could the capital be better deployed in the portfolio? What I mean here is, from a portfolio perspective, not just a market perspective, but am I deploying my resources and my investments in the best way overall in the company so that I'm getting the maximum return? What I've addressed here. You have not addressed a number of items when you're talking about big projects, when you're talking about waterfall, inventory, you've got process waste, there's, there's natural estimation buffers, there's, there's the weighting, there's gold. There are a number of items that I, can't, I could probably spend another hour talking about that actually are inherent in the waterfall that are reduced through this process because you've got a more efficient delivery. All that's going to do is further enhance the overall return. So putting it all together, what does this mean? We've talked about is historically we had these well-known uh, investment decisions and we would kind of stay away from the unknowable. That was an irrational approach. We wouldn't do things that we couldn't uh, we could confirm. And as a result, on a traditional business case, we would take a look. It was black or white either made sense or it didn't make sense. And if it made sense, we said yes. If it didn't make sense, we'd go on to the next one. So a traditional approach, we have the executives that are making the decision, and they say the business case is, is a go forward. They then allocate capital to the PMO. The PMO enforces their ch its charter. It has really no power to change it. But it moves forward, and it does by 
allocating the overall expense budget. Over time, the PMO's job is really to make sure that the money is spent properly. The point here is that that money needs to be spent all that needs to be spent. So when you look over time, you've got a project that you have one year, two year, three years of spending at a certain point you make even, and then there's an expectation that there's going to be a return. And we go back to our asphalt plant in 1965 that we're building, we have a high degree of uncertainty that that's going to make a lot of sense. That actually is a go forward. This is a low risk profile. It's a very good idea. We put our arms around the scope. We know the time and the budget. So we move forward on something like that. However, <clears throat> go back to the example of the manufacturer that moved to Mexico. They had two problems. Uh, they also had a failed ERP implementation that happened simultaneously uh, when they went down to Mexico. So they, they were struggling when they got there. And it was a good idea. They had multiple warehouses, and I mentioned multiple manufacturing, and they had were using antiquated system. So the concept of doing a state-of-the-art ERP system was very good, but it was new to them. And they really didn't have a, a full flavor of what the scope was. So even though it was a good idea, this was and because it was jeopardized, so was the time and so was the budget. So <clears throat> one of the things in the last years, this has been something that Angela has been very, very helpful for. We go through the same sequence where we've got a business case that the executives are going to go ahead and approve, going to go to the PMO, PMO is going to allocate the capital, PMO is going to enforce the charter, there's going to be no power to change it. So the project expense budget is approved. And up to this point, you really have any change from the traditional method. Now, of course, with Agile, once that expense allocation goes forward, we get into level of sprints. We have multiple releases. We've got this concept of a, of a product owner that's in place. But what's wrong with this picture? And the problem is, is that we still don't have the communication loop back. We don't have the feed of when that release comes into place, what's happening with the market? How's it being impacted by the market? We don't have the feedback for what's going on real time with the team and how that's being impacted. So we've limited our channel based on using the traditional methods in terms of giving feedback at the, executives, at the executive level. So what we're going to do is irrespective of how it's going in, in the, is we're going to continue those releases and we're going to spend all of the budget. So <clears throat> what this has done, it's done some good things. Its, it's uh, scope is reduced. The schedule risk has been reduced. And the expense budget has been reduced. So that's helpful in this scenario. But what it doesn't resolve is it doesn't resolve, what about if the biz business kept is uncertain? What about if the fundamental idea that we have, we just don't have enough knowledge about to have the certainty that it's going to be successful? So even if we're using a program level or at the project level, if we're not releasing it early, we're not taking advantage of those, those uh, hefty returns we can get, and the business concept is remaining untested. And even if the software is being released, if we don't have a feedback mechanism for taking that information from the early releases in one, impacting how the project's being run, and number two, impacting whether we even want to go forward with the project, we are getting ourselves in a scenario <clears throat> where we're not taking advantage and, and, and we have no way to stop a bad investment. So <clears throat> if we move on to a project in uh, 2012, you know, Go forward. The big issue here may be, is it even a good idea? Do we have enough information to determine whether this makes sense or not? Because we have this inescapable uncertainty that we can't get our arms around. Again, we've got one-way communication, so we can't address that through the traditional methods. 
But if we up the communication between the executive, the PMO, and the project and get that market feedback from a product owner perspective, what we can do is real time take the information and influence what we're doing. So where from a basis, we've got an executive uh, you know, decision. It's black or white decision to allocate the capital. <clears throat> Under the real options approach, we now have the ability to kind of address uncertainty. So when we take a look at it from an uncertain perspective, we've got now executive funding for option number one, executive for option number two, executive funding through the process, and it gets us to the point where we hit the uncertainty threshold and we actually have more confidence in making a bigger buy decision. But I would take that further to the point where even when we get to the point of feedback and getting that information, we need to take the next step and reprove the business case. So we take the information we have from a release perspective, and number one, we take those assumptions that were in business case number one, and we test them again. That leads to business case number two. And we go so on and so on, so, so on and so on, so that each release is kind of a mini business case going forward. So in summary, what we're talking, what we've talked about is that we've kind of reached an inflection point where the business case assumptions are not knowable prior to beginning the traditional investment. Agile real options help us navigate the unknown through incremental investment that increase our knowledge over the life of the investment. Applying Agile Real Options to the portfolio will diversify risk and enhance return. And then to fully exploit the Agile opportunity, executives should make incremental business cases validated, and they need to take that market information and that information from a program level on a feedback basis to give them the information they need to uh, go forward. Thanks, John. We're going to have some questions in a minute. But while John catches his breath and has a drink, Let's tell you a little bit about Solutions IQ. We have 30 years of experience in delivering software. Our broad range of consulting services spans training, coaching, and talent acquisition, and includes total outsource development. Our goal is to give customers the tools and collaboration they need to succeed. If you like this presentation, you can visit solutionsiq.com for other webinars, white papers, and videos on Agile and Scrum adoption. You'll be mailed a copy of the presentation as a result of your registering for this webinar. John, are you ready for some questions? I am. So, do estimates, do we change our estimates, asks Hajar Hamid, do we change our estimates as we progress for every release with the approach you're describing? Um, yeah, and I think if <clears throat> the concept of the business case uh, where we run out, you know, and it might be a 60-day process to get to a concluded business case, it's very difficult to kind of think, well, we're going to reopen that, we're going to do another 60-day process. I think exactly what we want to do is we want to take a look at what a velocity in the case of a technological project of a team is, and we want to have a realistic estimation as to when are we going to deliver and what that cost is associated with delivery. So from an estimation perspective, if we've got slower than anticipated velocity, that's going to impact the return. And if you've got a marginal project that is, say, hovering just above what your company's acceptable level is, that can impact whether it really makes sense for the organization to go forward or not. Now, one thing I want to add here, too, and, and caution people, we're talking about large cult cultural changes within organizations to adopt this. And one of the problems that we've seen is the culture, because we've had decades of taking this traditional methodology, the culture of project failure is one which killed the messenger. So 
to the extent that people see slow velocity or the project's not moving, historically, you don't want to raise that to senior management. That's going to be an issue. And not until organizations change the overall cultural shift so that they embrace providing that knowledge are you going to see a scenario where people are, messes, are, are maybe being entirely honest as to what, what it takes to get to the end game. Dave Miranda asks, how about infrastructure projects in IT departments? Can Agile help here? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I've actually, this comes up several times. And, you know, it would be great in a hypothetical world to say, you know what we're going to do is we're going to have every assumption be $5,000, and we're only going to allocate $5,000 to the decision. But if you are talking about infrastructure, there are going to be some big capital decisions that you need to make. There may be some big expense uh, items, uh, big equipment ticket items that need to be made. The point being is we take the value we can, and before we pull the trigger on the big ticket items, what we do is we garner information through the options approach to make sure we've got confidence in pulling the trigger on those big ticket items. This came up actually uh, last week in a conversation that I had with somebody, and they had talked about, well, you know, I've got a big equipment purchase, and there's a discount associated with it. And what I suggested to them is if you've got a discount, a big discount with equipment purchases, that may be because they're pushing yesterday's technology on you. Now, if your project is not sensitive to the level of technology in the equipment, maybe it makes sense to take advantage of that. If it is sensitive, however, Maybe you don't jump through hoops to get it done, but you actually do the evaluation to find out what the benefit of waiting around for the next level is. Then you can actually do the proper analysis to see if it makes sense. So getting real here, do you think it's realistic to think executive management will get involved continuously? Um, well, do I think it's realistic that the CEO is going to, day in and day out, monitor everything? No, I don't think so, unless it's a one-person organization. But I think if executive management is comfortable with the old process, and that process being starting a budget in a, say, September, October time frame, so taking decisions based on the market then, launching those projects in a January time frame with deliveries that don't take place till late in the year or potentially in subsequent years, if they think that their market is so secure that it's not going to change over that 18 to 24 month period of time, this may not make any sense. To the extent that that market is changing, it would be ill-advised for executives not to make sure that the system and the process that they have in place truly takes advantage of this, meaning that they actually have real-time information that can impact the decisions. So in that budget year, when June comes around, if there's new market information that's going to influence the success of a project, if I'm an executive, I want that information, and I want to be able to drive the decision. Well, John, we have more questions that we could possibly answer in the two minutes we have left. Now, the good news for all of you out there is that John's uh, willing and eager to receive any questions, including the ones we didn't get to that you asked, by email or phone. And you can contact him at jrudd at solutionsiq.com. We're really appreciative that you attended today's webinar. We're sorry for our initial uh, errors, but we'll do better next time. You'll get an email with links to the recorded version of this webinar and copies of today's slides to share with your colleagues. Thanks to version one for hosting this webinar, and we invite you to take a look at all of the resources and features on their site. Thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of your day.